look in my eyes. Exterior, a building on NYC's 9th Avenue and 47th Street, night. A chrome Harley sits on the sidewalk in front of a four-story building. A biker wearing leather jeans and a blue bandana leans against the building's glass door. An Irish, sickly pale man approaches the entrance door. The biker shakes his hand and points him to the third floor. Interior, inside the 9th Avenue clubhouse, night. The Irish man opens the clubhouse door and walks in. Inside the clubhouse is a coffee and tea counter with condiments. Scattered about are three bar stools, tables, and a couch. Near the street windows is a computer counter and two ceiling TV monitors above it. Eddie, a tall Latino man in the 50s, sits at the computer counter yelling into his cell phone. What's wrong? <clears throat> My fucking cable and TV isn't working. On the wall above where the Latino man sits is a New York City business license, which reads Eddie Gutierrez, owner. 9th Avenue Clubhouse, 2016. Henry, a hard-looking, muscular Puerto Rican man, heavily tattooed, earrings in both ears, walks up to the counter where Eddie sits. Eddie slams his cell phone shut, appearing frustrated. You're ending your day with a call to Time Warner, okay? Eddie gets up and pours a cup of coffee for Henry, walks back, spilling the coffee. Here's my day, Henry. First, no cable. Second sponsor shows up unexpectedly. Third spilled coffee on the floor. Henry smells the coffee, then takes a slow sip. So cafe is perfecto. The door opens to the AA meeting room, which is at the opposite end of the clubhouse. We hear people chanting the third step prayer. Relieve me of the bondage of self and take away my difficulties that the victory over them will witness those that I may help. The sound of an army of applause is heard. People start to walk out of the AA meeting room. Eddie turns the music volume up loud. People walk out the door. Some wave goodbye to Eddie. One gives him the finger. Take your recovery with you as you leave. I'm closing. Exterior, corner of 47th Street and 9th Avenue, night. Eddie, exhausted, stands at the street hailing a taxi. A yellow cab pulls up. He opens the rear door and slides in. 237 East 118th Street between 2nd and 3rd. Eddie glances quickly at the taxi driver's rearview mirror. He sees Karim, the taxi driver who's an early 30s, handsome, light skinned Arab man. Karim taps his steering wheel to Ukraine's SKAY song Love, which is heard playing. Going home? Eddie looks at the taxi driver's rearview mirror and sees these intense, black, mysterious, sexy eyes staring back. Yeah. Alone? If you must know, yes, why your rates go up for single people. Not too much. I drive all night long. Like you, I go home alone. Kareem stares piercingly into his rearview mirror at Eddie. Eddie looks back at those large black eyes. Feeling uncomfortable, he looks away and stares out into the street as all the Third Avenue stores pass by. You're generous with your assumptions, aren't you? <clears throat> I didn't notice you were with anybody. Why would you ask if I live alone? Something in your eyes. Must be the mascara. What? So you work in Times Square? Yes, I can still command two bills on any corner, but I'm making this my last season. <clears throat> what? Why do you speak like that? I speak gay. I also run a sober clubhouse for hardened alcoholics who are resistant to change. Kind of like a martyr for your cause. I could tell. A martyr? What a weird choice of wording. You could be right, though. You got a wife and kids at home? Eddie looks at the ceiling, then behind him. Am I in a taxi reality TV game show? If I don't get the answer right, I get kicked to the curb? Sorry, no. Why all the personal questions? Kareem turns a quick right off 3rd Avenue onto East 118th Street. His hands tremble a little. He wipes sweat from his forehead. He slows, looking out the driver's side window, searching for Eddie's address. He screeches to a halt. It's just that I don't know anyone in New York. No one to talk to. So what's your story? Kareem puts his gear shift into park, turns around, and with an intensity in his eyes looks right into Eddie's eyes. Eddie looks right back at Kareem's eyes with the same intensity. I'm not gay. You can't be Muslim and gay in Crimea. Crimea? Isn't that like one minute it belongs to Russia, then the next minute it belongs to Ukraine? You, Crimea does not belong to Russia. We Crimean Muslims are fighting against the Russian occupation. I'm sure that means something. 
nor do we acknowledge the existence of keys. Tell me, are there any people you acknowledge? Eddie puts his hand into his left jacket pocket and pulls out his wallet, a business card, and a pen. He writes his cell number on the flip side of his business card. He reaches his hand into the driver's area. Here's your fare. Will you like my business card? You'll find my cell number on it. I'm Eddie. Kareem takes Eddie's business card and turns around. He smiles and looks one last time into Eddie's eyes. Happy I met you. I'm Kareem. You're not like anyone I've ever met before. Annoying as all hell. Kareem gets out of the taxi and opens Eddie's door for him. Allow me. <laughs> Who said chivalry was dead? Kareem gets back into his cab, waits, and watches Eddie walk to his apartment door. Eddie puts the keys into the door lock, turns around, and gives Kareem a thumbs up and then a smile. Eddie watches Kareem drive away. His face turns pained, sad. Interior, inside Eddie's bedroom, night. Eddie's asleep in his bed. The small baby blue alarm clock on the top of his nightstand reads 2.05 a.m. Eddie's cell phone rings. He goes to turn it off, but notices the caller ID is blank. He lifts the receiver. It's me, Karim. I drove you home the other night. What's up? And please don't answer with a question. I'm driving a passenger near you. Is this a bad time to visit? Do you need my address? Eddie gets out of bed and walks to his living room and looks around. What am I doing? I'm too old for this. Oh well, where's my silver fox shoulder wrap? The living room is beautifully furnished with expensive antique furniture, a fireplace and a mantle. On the mantle is an array of pictures. Above the mantle is a mirrored antique oak-framed clock that reads 1.02 a.m. August 1st, 2016. Eddie looks into the mirrored oak clock. You're letting a complete stranger into your home at one in the morning. Again. The doorbell rings. Eddie opens the living room door. Kareem smiles and walks in. He's five foot nine, medium build, light olive brown complexion, thick dark black hair cut short with bangs covering the top of his forehead. He sits on the couch. Last night you said you weren't gay. It didn't exist wherever it is that you're from. Why are you here, Kareem? Kareem takes a deep breath. He grabs at his hand and pulls him towards him. Eddie sits next to Kareem. They exchange a long look into each other's eyes. That's only fair. Look, I'm not gay, but I know you are. Not the best introduction, but that'll do. One time. Doesn't make you gay, right? Am I reading you correctly? Would this be your first time? God, does that... Bring out the artist in me. Oh. Eddie stands and holds Kareem's hands, pulling him up towards him. They walk into Eddie's bedroom and lay on his bed. Afterwards, they turn, looking into each other's eyes. Eddie slowly gets up and walks to his chest of drawers. There's a CD player on it. He inserts a CD. Here's a song I played after you dropped me off. It's about the effect your eyes had on me as I saw them in your rear view mirror. He returns and sits on the bed, staring at Kareem. Eddie starts singing softly to Kareem the Chantelle's song, Look in My Eyes, that is heard playing. Look in my eyes and tell me you're the one for me, and that our love will always be. Wow, old school, but beautiful music. I've always lived vicariously through music. Certain songs talk for me. This is one. Eddie gets up and walks toward the living room. Kareem following right behind. They sit on the couch. They exchange their eyes once again. How are you? Feeling-wise? I'm not sure. How am I supposed to be feeling? Just feel only with your heart, Kareem. Do not feel with your head. I have to get back to work. So sudden? Just like that? Sorry, I work 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. I got to run. All right. All right. Before you go, what's your number? I don't have one for you. What? Then tell me how do I get a hold of you? You're married? I'm single. You can't get a hold of me. My cell is used strictly for my family. Ah, I love secrecy in a man. Eddie and Kareem walk to the living room door. Eddie opens it. Kareem walks out slowly. He turns around, exchanging those eyes at Eddie for a few seconds. I'm so grateful that it was you that I had my first experience with tonight. Eddie goes to his bedroom and turns the CD volume up. 
then closes the door and leans against it dramatically. He starts singing another verse of the Chantel song, Look in My Eyes, that is heard playing. I don't need much, I need a touch. Come and love me, please, oh darling, save me free. Interior, inside Eddie's living room, night. Eddie's cell phone rings, the caller ID is blank. Eddie picks up his phone, clasps it against his heart, sways around the room and sings a few verses from Vicky Carr's song, Let It Please Be Him. That's when the phone rings and I jump. <laughs> and as I grab the phone, I pray, Let it please be him. Oh Lord God, it must be him or I shall die. Eddie answers the phone. I'm in your neighborhood again. Can I stop by and say 20? The doorbell rings. Eddie opens the living room door. Karim walks in. They hug tightly. Karim sits on the couch, motions for Eddie to sit with him. You're my first gay friend, number two Harris. Someone who will show me a new way. We'll both show each other a new way. Do you have a partner? I did. I do. Paul was a long-term HIV survivor. He died three years ago. And you've been empty since? At times it's, it's just unbearable. You don't know what it's like. I do know. In 2014, Russia invaded Crimea. My father was a leader of the Tartars, a Muslim insurgency group fighting the Russians. Give me time to comprehend all that. The Russians killed him. The hatred from my mother and my two brothers toward anything Russian is why I'm here in New York City. So you too come with a heavy heart. Sad, isn't it? We were both powerless to do anything. I'm not so sure of that. Interior, inside the Ninth Avenue clubhouse, day. People are putting up Thanksgiving Day decorations and a sign stating what hours Thanksgiving dinner will be served and the need for volunteers to help. Eddie and Henry sit at the oak dining table, sharing coffee and donuts. I have someone new in my life. He's a 31-year-old taxi driver. You okay with the age difference? That isn't what concerns me. He has such uh, beautiful qualities. Handsome, sensitive, caring. But the only time I see him is one or two in the morning. So you're a booty call. Nothing wrong with having a taxi driver around that deliveries. I can't get any personal information out of him. Nothing. Not even his cell number. Why do you think all the secrecy? He's Muslim. I'm his first uh, gay experience. We can all recall a time when we were afraid of being found out. You said Muslim. It has to be difficult for him. There's a part of me that says it might be something more than that. Confront him. Ask him if he's keeping anything from you. Interior, inside Eddie's living room, night. Eddie and Kareem are sitting on the living room couch, eating pizza. The TV is on, but not loud. You once said gays don't exist in Crimea. How can that be? Recently, these Muslim terrorists made the family of a gay man blind him and throw him off the roof of his home. I get it. His death was for everyone to see. And the Russian government is so openly hostile toward gays now you know why they don't exist. When I was a kid, about 13, I went and confessed to the Irish priest about the sexual experiences I was having with the boy. You felt guilty that it was wrong? No. I went for understanding. That priest told me I was going to hell. I was ruining my body and I would eventually go crazy. Not too understanding. What did we do wrong? Eddie walks to the mantle and picks up the picture of a very young Eddie and his friends at the unveiling of the AIDS quilt in Washington, D.C. My government had a deliberate role in allowing the AIDS epidemic to grow. They did absolutely nothing to stop it. Flashback, 1988. Eddie and his friends are walking around at the unveiling of the AIDS quilt in Washington, D.C. They stop at this quilt they made for a friend, Chuck Peters, who died from AIDS the year before. Eddie places a picture of him and his friends on the quilt. They bow their heads and wipe tears from their eyes. Eddie cries uncontrollably. Paul comforts him. Cleve Jones can be seen in the background, reading off the names of people who died from AIDS. End of flashback. 
back to present day. That year alone, the death toll from AIDS killed 175,000 Americans. It was considered a gay-related infectious disease, so the federal government refused help. Betty turns the TV volume up. Fox News is showing a video of a Russian-led bombing into Aleppo. A distraught man is pulling a young boy from under the rubble of their home. The young boy is bleeding from his head and screams. Am I going to die? Am I going to die? I feel like that poor child, growing up in a world full of violence. He just wants to play. Eddie changes the TV channels and motions for Karim to look at the TV screen. On the screen, Betty Davis starts walking up a flight of stairs, looks back and says, Fasten your seatbelts, you're in for a bumpy ride. In this scene, she's being treated like she's paranoid. Then she's wrong for thinking someone's out to get her. She sounds gay. Later, the TV screen shows the credits to Betty Davis's All About Eve movie. Kareem clutches Eddie's hand, gets up, and walks to the bedroom. Kareem turns the light switch off. Afterwards, Eddie lights a cigarette and props himself up against the mahogany wood backboard. Why do you leave so abruptly? Why can't I get a phone number to reach you? It's the way it has to be for now. Be patient with me. I know a mystery being played out. I just don't know how this is going to end. I don't know how our story ends either. I don't want it to end now. I don't know where you live, your family, who's your friends. My father's dead. My mother and two brothers are in Ukraine. Other than that, I have nothing more to share. Isn't that bad? Yes. I'm afraid if you knew everything about me, I'd lose you. <laughs>